go. Okay, so we're coming towards the end of our book, um, The Call of the Wild. We left Buck in dire straits last week, I'm afraid, and his um, fellow dogs are all suffering terribly on the trail. Um, Eleanor, whenever you're ready, if you would like to uh, start reading. Yes, I, 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 I'm ready. Can you hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> As it was with Buck, uh, uh, I apologize, it's not me, it's my uncle, <laughs> it's quite noisy today. As it was with Buck, so was it with his mates, they were perambulating skeletons. There were seven all together, including him, in their very great misery, they had become insensible to the bite of the lash or the bruise of the club. The pain of the beating was dull and distant, just as the things the eyes saw and the ears had, seemed, had seemed dull and distant. They were not half living or quarter living. They were simply so many bags of bones in which sparks of life fluttered faintly. When the hold was made, they dropped down in the traces like dead dogs, and the spark dimmed and paid and seemed to go out. And when the clap or whip fell upon them, the spark fluttered feebly up, and they tottered to their feet and staggered on. There came a day when Billy, the good-natured, fell and could not rise. Hal had traded off his revolver, and he took the axe and knocked Billy on the head as he lay in the traces, then cut the carcass out of the harness and dragged it to one side. Buck saw and his mate saw, and they knew that this thing was very close to them. On the next day Kuna went, and but five of them remained, Joe too far gone to be, to be malignant, Pike crippled and limping, only half conscious and not conscious enough longer for Malinja. Solex, the one eyed, still faithful to the toil of trace and trail, and mournful in that he had so little strength with which to pull. Teak, who had not travelled so far that winter, and who was now beaten more than the others because he was fresher and back still at the head of the team, but no longer uh, enforcing discipline or striving to enforce it, blind with the weakness half the time, and keeping the trail by the loom of it and by the dim feel of his feet. It was beautiful spring weather, but neither dogs nor humans were aware of it. Each day the sun rose earlier and set later, it was done by three in the morning, and twilight lingered till nine at night. The hell long day was a blaze of sunshine. The ghostly winter silence had given way to the great spring murmur of awakening life. This murmur arose from all the land, fraught with the joy of living. It came from the things that lived and moved again, things which had been as dead and which had not moved during the long months of frost. The sap was rising in the pines, the willows and aspens were bursting out in young buds, shrubs and vines were putting on fresh gaps of green, crickets sang in the nights, and in the days all manner of creeping, crawling things rustled, rustled forth, into the sun. Patridges and woodpeckers were booming and knocking in the forest. Squirrels were chattering, birds singing, and overhead honked the white fowl driving up from the south in cunning wedges that split the air. From every hill slope came the trick of running water, the music of unseen fountains or things were thawing, bending, snapping. 
The Yukon was straining to break loose the ice that bound it down. It ate away from beneath. The sun ate from above. Her hairs formed, fishes sprang and spread apart, while, th while thin sections of ice fell through bodily into the river. And amid all this bursting, rending, throbbing of awakening life, under the blazing sun and through the soft sighing breezes, like wayfarers to death, staggered the two men, the woman, woman and the huskies. With the dogs falling, Mercedes weeping and riding, Hal swearing innocuously, and Charles's eyes wistfully watering, they staggered into John Thornton's camp at the mouth of White River. When they halted, the dogs dropped down as though they had all been struck dead. Mercedes dried her eyes and looked at, at John Thornton. Charles sat down on a log to rest. He sat down very slowly and painstakingly, but of his great stiffness. Hal did the talking. John Thornton was whittling the last touches on an axe handle he had made from a stick of birch. He waited and listened, gave monosyllabic replies, and, when it was asked, Tess advice. He knew the breed, and he gave his advice in the certainty that it would not be followed. They told us up above that the bottom was dropping out of a trail and that the best thing for us to do was to lay over. Hal said in response to Thornton's warning to take no more chances on the rotten ice. They told us we couldn't make White River and here we are, this last with a sneering ring of triumph in it. And they told you true. John Thornton, Thornton answered, the bottom's likely to drop out in at any moment. Only fools, with the blind luck of fools, could have made it. I tell you straight, I wouldn't risk my carcass on that ice for all the gold in Alaska. Very good, well done. Okay. Some so, noise could hear it. Uh, um, sorry, Eleanor. No, no, it was fine. Um, you've got a noisy yeah, uncle with you, you, have you? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I have no idea what they, they are do, doing, doing. <laughs> renovating. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully they'll... Um, but it didn't affect your voice at all. I didn't. I don't know if anybody else heard Oh, anything, great, great. Yes. Right, it's good. It's all good. Okay, so, um, first of all, nicely read. Well done. It's always difficult being the first one. Um so we'll start with the first word here to perambulate perambulating uh, perambulating Very ambulating good, yes. yeah perambulating a uh, halt yes yes halt it's easy yeah, it's, it's uh -huh, just, okay yeah, I... yeah the the first one though it's just um don't stress that first syllable per it's like percent but perambulating okay um it's not like perambulating saying, price per uh -huh. pound it's just so you don't stress the first syllable it's just to perambulate we were perambulating okay the next one halt yeah you, you were right halt, halt. Yeah, yeah yeah it's, yeah. it's and, yeah. <laughs> and then malinga with the hard g sound malinga okay yeah, yeah. and it's uh, like we say the I same was... with linger finger linger malinga okay 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 then honked get those Honk. Endings. Honked. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And your favourite, old, wild fowl. The way you said it, it sounded too much like wide fowl. It's wild fowl. Uh, wide. wild fowl. Wild, <laughs> wild. <laughs> okay. And then the last one again, the ending, just the ending, whittled. 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 That's it. Yeah. So try try uh. to get those word endings when you're reading as well in, in a in a sentence. Okay. And watch out for those olds. They might taste nice, but um, it's one of your most common oh. mistakes, I'm afraid. <laughs> old, 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 old. 
<laughs> and sometimes it doesn't matter that much. But like with wildfowl, uh, I really did hear wildfowl. <laughs> I was like, I was imagining big fat chickens. <laughs> Yes, quite yes, of course. I I I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Any questions before we move on? Um Shiny's asked, do you think justice is coming? Well, justice karma maybe. <laughs> uh by the way, I have updated the documents. Oh, thank you. Have you got the link? Yes, yes. Let me yes. put it onto the text as well, so people know. Okay, let me just see if I can... Do, do, do. Cut and paste. Cut and paste, cut and paste. Always have to be careful when I cut and paste. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Okay, no questions. Then we will move on a pace. And uh, Marco, Rima... Um, if you are ready to read. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, from That's Because. That's the one, yes. Okay. That's because you're not a fool, I suppose, said Hal. All the same, we'll go on to Dawson. He uncoiled his whip. Get up there, Buck. Hi, get up there. Mash on. Thornton went on whittling. It was idle, he knew, to get between a fool and his fully, folly, while two or three fools more or less would not alter the scheme of things. But the team did not get up at the command. It had long since passed into the stage where blows were required to ro rose it. The whip flashed out here and there on its merciless errands. Mercil merciless errands. Uh, John Thornton compressed his lips. Solex was the first to crawl to his feet. Tick fo followed. Joe came next, yelping with pain. Pike made painful efforts. Twice he fell over, then half up, and on the third attempt managed to rise. Buck made no effort. He laid he lay quietly where he had fallen. The lash bit into him again and again, but he neither whined nor struggled. Several times Thornton started, as though to speak, but changed his mind. A moisture came into his eyes, into his eyes, and as the weeping continued, he arose and woke Irresolutely, irresolutely up and down. This was the first time Buck had failed, in itself a sufficient reason to drive Hal into a rage. He exchanged the whip for the customary club. Buck refused to move under the rain of heavier blows which now fell upon him, now fell upon him. Like his mates, he was barely able to get up, but unlike them, he had made up his mind not to get up. He had a vague feeling of impending doom. This had been strong upon him when he pulled in, in to the bank, and it had not departed from him. What of the thin and rotten ice he had felt under his feet all day? It seemed that he se sensed disaster close at hand. Out there, ahead on the ice where his master was trying to drive him, he refused to stir. So greatly had he suffered, and so far gone was he that the blows did not hurt much. And as they continued to fall upon him, the spark of life within flickered and went down. It was nearly, nearly out. He felt strangely numb. As though from a great distance, as though from a great distance he was aware that he was being beaten. The last sensations of pain left him. He no longer felt anything, though very faintly he could hear the impact 
impact of the club upon his body. Body. But it was no longer his body. It seemed so far away. And then, suddenly, without warning, uttering a cry that was inarticulate and more like the cry of an animal, John Thornton sprang upon the man who wielded, wielded the club. Hal was half back, backward, as though struck by a falling tree. Mercedes screamed. Charles looked on wistfully, uh, wiped his watery eyes, but did, did uh, not get up because of his stiffness. John Thornton stood over back, struggling to control himself, to convulse with rage to speak. If you strike that dog again, I'll kill you, he at last managed to say in a choking voice. It's my dog, Hal replied, wiping the blood from his mouth as he came back. Get out of my way or I'll fix you. I'm going to Dawson. Thornton stood between him and Buck and evinced no intention of getting out of the way. Hal drew his long hunting knife. Mercedes screamed, cried, laughed, and manifest the chaotic um, um, abandonment of hy hysteria. Thornton wrapped Hal's knuckles with the axe handle, knocking, knocking the knife to the ground. He wrapped his knuckles again as he, as he tried to pick it up. Then he stoop, stopped picked it up himself, and with two strokes, cut Buck's traces. Hal had no fight left in him. Besides, his hands were full, were full with his sister, on his arms, rather, while Buck was too near dead to be, or, to be of further use in holding the sled. A few minutes later, they pulled out from the bank and down the river. Buck heard them go and raised his head to see. Pike was le uh, leading, Solex was at the wheel, and between were Joe and Tick. They were, uh, they were limping and staggering. Mercedes was riding the loaded sled. Hal guided at the jeep pool, and Charles stumbled upon, upon, stumbled along, <laughs> stumbled along in the rear. As Buck watched them, Thornton knelt beside him and with rough, kindly hands searched for broken bones. By the time his search had disclosed, nothing more than many bruises and a state of terrible starvation, the sled was a quarter of a mile away. Dog and man watched it crawling along over the ice. Suddenly, they saw its back and dropped down as into a rat and the jeep pole with Hal cl clanging to it, jerked into the air. Mercedes' scream came to their ears. They saw Charles turn and make one step to, to run back, and then a whole section of ice give way and dogs and humans disappear. A yawning hole was all that was to be seen. The bottom had dropped out of the trail. John Horton and Buck looked at each other. You poor devil, said John Horton, and Buck licked his hand. Very good. Well done. Well done. Oh, my goodness, yes. So justice, well, it's not really justice for the dogs, is it? They got taken to their death by their own uh, owners, who should have known better, but often we don't, do we? So, um... On that uh, sad note, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes you think there is no justice in the world and then other times you see it enacted in front of you and you think, oh, well, maybe there is. At least the dogs aren't suffering anymore. So um, let's just look at the individual words first. Um, we'll start with to rouse, rouse, to rouse someone. It's like waking them up. OK, try it, Rima. To rouse. Uh, rouse. To That's rouse. It. And then 
choking. You've got to really make sure you get the ch sound. Okay. Choking. Yes. Because if you say joking, the harder j rather than the ch. If you can hear the difference, j ch, choking, not joking. Okay. Choking. Choking. To again. choke the throat. The throat. To choke, is yes. Chokes. To choke somebody oh. is to strangle them. Yeah. Because we have ch letter in our language, so I, I think that I I can't do it good. Ch <laughs> ch 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 yeah, ch like church. Church ch has got ch two of them. Church. And uh, is chill. It's too strong when I said ch 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 ch. That's fine. That's fine. But then you've got to add yeah, choke. 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 That's it. Choke. It's just something to be aware okay. of. Okay. Then <laughs> stooped. You actually started saying stew and oh. then you stopped and you said stopped. <laughs> and <I> stopped. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so it's an ooh. Stooped. 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 Yeah, so if you're not standing up straight, if you bend over to maybe to go through a low doorway, you're stooping. Yeah, your back's bent it's to stoop. She stoops to conquer. Very famous. Okay. And then the next one, it's the ing. Clinging. Clinging. Ing. Uh, with silent G. Clinging. Well, yes, it's ing. I mean, the, the G is there, ing, but it forms the whole, I-N-G forms the whole sound, ing. So it's not yes, clinging. Yes, but I-N-G, but... Uh, it's clinging. Uh, yes, but, okay, clinging. clinging not clinging, or clinging. 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 Cling, clinging, clinging, yes, clinging. Cling, okay, that's clinging. it, <laughs> to cling, yes, yes, yes. yeah, cling. to cling. Children often cling to their parents, yeah, they want to be held, they want to be held, they won't let go, they're clingy, <laughs> to cling. And then, I just wanted to confirm, it is stumbled along, because I know exactly what you were about to say, and it was your brain thinking, yes, to stumble yes. upon. <laughs> And, and it just shows correct. you. Yeah, yeah, you corrected <laughs> yes. yourself, which was great. But I could tell what you wanted to say. It's strange how your brain, <laughs> yeah. your brain just latches onto a phrase that it understands, even though the letters are written straight in front of you, right in front of you, to stumble along. Okay. <laughs> it means they were walking exhaustedly. Yeah, they weren't able to walk purposefully. They were just so tired they were stumbling okay whereas to stumble upon something it's nothing to do with stumbling as such it just means to find something okay okay so Reem wants to join us so we'll send Reem a teleport okay Okay, so um, the next one, you get the smileys. Look at all those smileys. So the first one, just to oh. confirm you're right, is folly. I think your smileys folly. almost outweigh your... I think they outweigh your, your um, corrections. <laughs> so folly, it's folly. Um, then merciless. Merciless. Merciless, yeah. Yeah. To nowhere. Okay. Yeah, and irresolutely. Irresolutely. Irresolute. And then just to confirm, it was body, not buddy. <laughs> I buddies. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Buddy as in friend, body. We've all got a body and I hope we've all got lots of buddies too. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Eleanor. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Well done. And as I say, very nicely read. Well done. Okay, so that brings us to chapter six. And uh, Can you pronounce this word uh, again, Lil? Hang on. Let me see where it is. I'm just trying to find my piece of text again. Um, oh, evinced. Oh, evinced. Oh, yes. Mm. Um, let me just check that. Evinced, I would say. Now, I tend to say um, evinced, but um, it might be... Um, it just means, oh, I don't know. Like it's it's like it comes from like evidence, okay. But I say evince, not evince, okay. Evince. E, evince. E, yeah. Evince. Now, when I when you wrote it, 
and I don't know why, but I tend to say envinced. Um, and I don't know why, but I do. I think it's it's very po possible. Uh, <laughs> it's just one of those things I've learnt when I was younger, and it's practically not even a word. It is evince, but I often say envinced. Um, don't ask me why. <laughs> Although we do say evidence, okay? Evidence. Evidence, but to events. Okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna check on invinced because when you wrote it I saw invinced and then I did exactly what Marco did. Yeah, my brain saw what I was expecting, and then I thought, oh no, that's one of my common mistakes to say it envinced. And I wrote it once in a um, at university. I was writing some rubbish about uh, organizational structure, and uh, and I wrote envinces, and I had an argument with my tutor, <laughs> and they won because <laughs> my word doesn't exist. <laughs> Or if it does, it's 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 one of those words that only exists because other people use it as well. <laughs> See, we all do it. <laughs> okay, so um, shiny, are you able to read today? Yes. Yay! Excellent. Goody goody goody. <laughs> I'm happy. So we're on chapter six for the love of a man. Okay. Okay. From the beginning. When John Thornton falls his feet in the previous December, his partners had met him, made him comfortable and left him to get well, going on themselves up the river to get out a raft or of so longs for Dawson. He was still limping slightly at the time he rescued Buck, but with the continued warm weather, even the slight limp left him. And here, lying by the river bank through the long spring days, watching the running water, listening leslie to the songs of birds and the hum of nature, Buck slowly won back his strength. A rest comes very good after one has traveled 3,000 miles, and it must be confessed that Buck waxed lazy as his woods, wounds healed, his muscles swelled out, and the flesh came back to cover his bones. For that matter, they were all laughing, laughing Buck, John Thornton, and Skeet and Nick, waiting for the raft to come that was to carry them down to Dawson. Skeet was a little Irish setter who early made friends with Buck, who, in the dying condition, was unable to resent her first advance, advances. She had a daughter trait, which some dogs possess passes, and as a mother cat washes her kittens, so she washed and cleansed Buck's wounds regularly. Each morning after he had finished his breakfast, breakfast, she performed her self-appointed task till he came back to look for her ministrations as much as he did for Thornton's need, equally friendly, though less demonstrative, was a huge black dog, half black hound and half deer hound, with eyes that laughed and a boundless good nature. To Buck's surprise, these dogs manifest to no jealousy toward him. They seemed to share the kindness and largeness of John Thornton, 
as Bach grew stronger, they enticed him into all sorts of ridiculous games in which Thornton himself could not could not forbear to join in and in this fashion Buck Rump through his convalescence and into a new existence love genuine passion passion passionate love was his for the first time this he had never never experienced at Judge Miller's town in the sun kissed Santa Clara Valley, with the judge's sons hunting and tramping it it had been a working partnership with the judge's grandsons and sort of pompous guardianship and with the judge himself a stately and dignified friendship. But love that was feverish and feverish and burning, that was adoration, and uh, that was madness. It had taken John Thornton to a road. This man had saved his life, which was something, but further he was the, the ideal master. Other men so to the welfare of their dogs from a sense of duty and business expediency, he saw to the welfare of his as if they were his own children because he could not help it. And he saw further, he never forgot a kindly greeting or a cheering word and to sit down for a long walk talk with them. Guess he called it was as much his delight as theirs. He had a way of taking Buck's head roughly between his hands and resting his own head upon Buck's of shaking him back and forth the while calling the, the while calling him ill names that to Buck were love names. Buck knew no greater joy than that rough embrace and the sound of murmured oath. And at each jerk back and forth it seemed it seemed that his heart would be shaken out of his body so great was its ec ecstasy. And when released, he sprang to his feet, his mouth laughing, his eyes eloquent, his throat vibrate with unuttered sound, and in that fashion remained without movement. John Thornton would reverently exclaim, God, you can all but speak. Very good. Buck had a trick. Yep. Okay, well done. <laughs> yeah, you have to stop eventually, I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, it's interesting. We've got something to work on here. Okay. Um, and it's your A, the long A sound that you use. Okay. So uh, let's have a look at the individual words to start with. Okay. So first of all, lazily. Lazily. Long A. Try it. Lazily. Perfect. Good. And nature. Long A. Nature. Nature. Yep. Nature. Good. Now, um, the next one is possess. To possess something. Possess. Good. And I know we demonstrate, but this is demonstrative. Mm. It's not fair, is it? Demonstrative. So, Yay, well done. Demonstrative of such and such. Uh, to demonstrate is the verb, but demonstrative of, um, it just changes slightly and it's not fair. <laughs> but that's English for you. I have to keep apologising. <laughs> OK, so and, and it's just to separate that noun from, uh, sorry, the verb from the adjective. OK, demonstrative. Then 
I get passionate. Now, this one isn't eight. I'm sorry. Again, apologies. So you've got passionate feelings. Passionate. Passionate. Good. Then the long E next. Feverish. To have a fever, to feel feverish. Feverish. Okay, the next one is this long A. Taken. Not taken, taken. To take, taken. Try it. Taken. Good. Um, the next one is the A uh sound at the beginning. Arouse. To arouse. Arouse. That's arouse. It. And then the A sound again. Saved. Saved. Good. Expediency. Expediency. Yes, if something is expedient, it means it's kind of the easiest way to do it. The most um, practical thing to do, convenient, but not necessarily the right thing to do. That's, you know, we often fall into the trap of doing something because it's expedient. It's not always, it's the easiest thing, but it's not always the right thing. Okay. Then um, the next one, upon, upon. Upon. Yeah. Upon. Upon. Uh, then we've got the A again. Shaken. Shaken. Not shaken. 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 Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll give you. Uh, okay, I'll give you some work to do on that one. Okay. Ich bin nicht der Typ, der sich gerne was vorschreiben lässt. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm going to give you that to practice. That's it's got practice. shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. <laughs> That's your karaoke homework for the week. Um, okay, so shake and then okay. ecstasy. 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 Yeah, we say ecstatic, but ecstasy. Again, the difference ecstasy. between. Yeah. Uh, then vibrant. Vibrant. Yeah, good. And again, good. the A sound, exclaim, exclaim. Exclaim. Not exclaim, exclaim. Exclaim. That's better, you're getting there, okay? So, if you watch the recording, you'll hear these, eh. You, you tend to say eh instead of a. Okay, it's something you need to long, the long vowel a, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. Okay, um, then, oh, bear with me a second, I've got to go, whoa, that was a funny noise. <laughs> I'm just trying to find the text, oh, there it is. And this is, again, what's happening to um, Rayma. You're adding words that don't exist. Because here it says, till he came to look for her ministrations. Not till he came back. <laughs> 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 you just stuck back in because you know the word, the phrasal verb to come back. But uh, this was just, he came to look for her ministrations. Nothing to do with movement. It's just, um, he was expecting it. Yeah. He came to expect it. Okay. So try reading oh, that out. Try to correct. Uh, Till he came to look for her ministrations. Okay. Thank you, Rima. Um, now, Shiny, if you'd like to read your correction. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> shiny, oh shiny, Marco is taking your corrections for you. Isn't that nice of him? <laughs> okay, shiny, if you'd like to just read, read that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Till he came to look for his ministrations. That is it, good. And it just shows you your your brain will try to form words that make sense, even though they're not written. It will just slot them in. It's it's weird how the brain works. <laughs> no, I said it's um, I said it's like Rima see, putting words in that aren't there. But I didn't mean it was Rima. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, it's Anyhow, you get <laughs> <laughs> you get two smileys. Uh, first one made. So you did it. You you corrected yourself. To made, that's the A sound you need to work on. And loafing, to loaf around. Does everybody know what it means to loaf? Yeah. 
if you're loafing around? Uh, it, yes, lounge uh, about. Uh, yeah, it looks like April's loafing about. <laughs> She's sitting there, uh, very relaxed. It's about on the rug. me and Science Twenty Four. <laughs> we always like that. <laughs> okay, it's okay. nothing to do with poop. No, <laughs> it's just to do with relaxing. Doing nothing. Doing nothing. Yes, I love loafing around on a Sunday. This <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> <in> my notes. <laughs> I I have. Uh, ah, added excellent. Uh -huh, Good. Already. Yeah. So it's not it's not to be it's not to be confused with bread a loaf of bread but to loaf yes it's a different meaning totally uh, different loaf meaning yeah good well done okay so April loafing around on the rug there <laughs> are you ready to read April oh any questions. Loafing around or just loafing? Um, you can say or either. Do we have... You can say either. It doesn't matter. Loaf around or just to loaf. I like loafing on a Sunday. I like to loaf around. It's just clearer um, what you mean. Okay. As if they were his. Um, in what, what, what do you mean? Uh, was uh, uh, I was really wondering what what does it mean? I've been reading some literatures. These words they're mostly used in the readings. I don't know what's the meaning of this. But he, here he's put it as if they were his own children. Okay, they aren't. I mean, dogs aren't your children, but he he was looking after them as if they were his children, as if they were his children. Okay, I sometimes treat like her as if she were my child. Okay, but um, I know she's a dog. <laughs> so when she's on the sofa and I want to sit on the sofa, she gets off the sofa. Some people don't do that. They go, oh, look, no, don't disturb her. No, she gets down. <laughs> they are childlike. Absolutely. Um, what else? What sort of thing, daft thing do I do as if something were something else? It's, it's basically a conditional um, it makes no sense because, of course, they weren't his children, but he treated them with great kindness as if they were. Okay. Is that okay, Moz? So if you think about the conditional uh, sentence, that's what we're looking at, as if they were, but they're not. <laughs> uh, what do you think that the, the gas here means? Uh, to gas, it means to talk, yeah, gassing. Ah, we okay. really do use that as well. It's just a slang form of to talk. Yeah, quick gassing, quick gassing when you want somebody to be quiet, if they, especially gossipy talk, talk, okay? So nothing to do with gas central heating. <laughs> just... I like gassing sometimes. It's nice talking about innocuous things. And I mean, t when you're talking with dogs, really, you, you can only gas because they don't really fully. They look like they understand you, but they understand keywords and they're listening out for keywords like biscuit and <laughs> walk. <laughs> OK. Okay, so April, Fra, I think we're on Buck had a trick of love expression that was akin to hurt. If, whenever you're ready, if there are no more questions. Uh, no, <laughs> no, to gas. Um, you might want to careful because if you, uh, I'm going to gas sounds a little bit more like I'm going to fart because gas is also um, basically farting. So <laughs> you want to be careful how you use it in what context. We were gassing just means we were talking. I'm going to gas could be misinterpreted. <laughs> but then you could always blame it on Buck. He's right next to you. you go, Buck, did you have to? <laughs> oh, the dog farted. <laughs> oh, English is fun. English is fun. <laughs> OK, April. Uh, okay. Whenever you're ready. 
Doc had the trick of a of love expression that was akin to hurt. He would often seize Thornton's hand in his mouth and close so fiercely that the flesh bore the impress of his teeth for some time afterward. And as Buck understood the oath to be love words, so the man understood this faint bite for a, ca a caress for a caress. For the most part, however, Buck's love was expressed in adoration. While he went wild with happiness when Thornton touched him or spoke to him, he did not seek these tokens. Unlike Skeet, who was wont to who was wont to shove her nose under Thornton's hand and nudge and nudge till petted, or Nick, who would stock up and rest his great head on Thornton's knee, Buck was content to adore at a distance. He would lie by the by the hour, eager, alert, at Thornton's feet, looking up into his face, dwelling upon it, studying it, following with keenest interest its fleeting expression, every movement or change of feature. Or, as chance might have it, he would lie far, farther away to the side or rear, watching the, the outlines of the man and the occasional movements of his body, and often such was the communion in which they lived, the strength of Buck's gaze would draw John Thornton's head around, and he would return the gaze with, uh, without speech, his heart shining out of his eyes, eyes as Buck's heart shone out. For a long time after his rescue, Buck did not like Thornton to get out of his sight. From the moment he left the tent to when he entered it again, Buck would follow at his heels. His transient masters, since he had come into the Northland, had bred in him a fear that no master could be permanent. He was afraid that Thornton would pass out of his life as Perrault and Francois and the Scotch half-breed had passed out. Even in the night, in his dreams, he was haunted by, his, by this fear. At such times, he would shake off sleep and creep through the chill to the flap of the tent, where he would stand and listen to the sound of his master's breathing. But in spite of this great love, he bore John Taunton, which seemed to bespeak the soft, civilizing influence, the strain of the primitive which the Northland had aroused in him, remained alive and active. Faithfulness and devotion, things born of fire and roof, were his, yet he retained his wildness and wiliness. He was a thing of the wild, coming from the wild to sit by John Thornton's fire, rather than a dog of the soft Southland, stamped with the marks of generations of civil civilization. Because of, because of his very great love, he could not steal from this man, but from any other man in any other camp. He did not hesitate an, an instant, while the cunning with which he stole enabled him to escape detection. His face and body was caught by, scored, were scored by the teeth of many dogs, and he fought as fierce, fiercely as ever and more shrewdly. Skeet and Nick were too good-natured for quarreling. Besides, they, lo they belonged to John Taunton, but the strange dog, no matter what the breed or valor, swiftly acknowledged, acknowledged Buck's supremacy or found himself struggling for life with a terrible antagonist, antagonist. and Buck was merciless. He had learned well the law of club and fang, and he never forewent an advantage or drew back from a foe he had started on the way to death. 
He had lessened from speech and from the chief fighting dogs of the police and mail, and knew there was no middle course. He must master or be mastered, while to show mercy was a weakness. Mercy did not exist in the primordial life. It was misunderstood for fear, and such misunderstandings made for death. Kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, was the law, and this mandate, down out of the depths of time, he obeyed. Well done. Okay, nicely read. So, um, just bear with me one second. Just a couple of words um, for you. We'll look at the individual words first. Okay. Uh, now, I've got to check this one because it's one of those... Um, yeah, it's one of those words where... I've just got to send Rima Teleport again, sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, so um, it's one of those words that it matters what the context was. And I think this was, I should have written it down, but I think this was to close, uh, not close. But I've got to be, I've got to just check. Ah. Uh, 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 uh. Close so fiercely. Lynn. Where was it? Oh, yes, and close. Yeah, close, not close. <laughs> so you've got to get the close. It close so fiercely. His mouth would close, as in opposite of open. Okay, naughty dog. <laughs> okay, so try it, close. Close. That's Is it. that a verb or... Um... Yeah, you said uh, close. So you, you said close so fiercely. You're standing close to Eleanor, and you're sitting. You're sitting close to Buck. Okay, but this was close. Okay. Okay. The next one, you've just again a little bit like Eleanor was doing earlier. You've got to get the d touched. It's a t ending, but you've got to get it to show it's in the past. To touch, he touched. <laughs> Touched. Touched, yeah. yes. Touched. <laughs> Absolutely, Eleanor, a bad influence. Then the next one is a strange one. We we do say there's a there's a funny verb to hove into view, but this is shove. It's a of sound, like love. Shove. Try it. Uh, shove. That's shove. it. Shove. Literally, shove. Ignore the E at the end, it's just shove. Okay. And the last one, primordial, primordial, the primordial soup. Primordial, primo, oh, primordial, <laughs> the what to, ah, uh, it's primordial, that's primordial. It. Well done, yeah, that's it, primordial. Okay, um, then, sorry, I've got Reem trying to contact me desperately, so I'm a bit distracted. Okay, <laughs> then uh, you get a smiley. Okay, and it's for this one, just to confirm it. Civilization, civilization, okay. Yeah, civilization. Yeah, good. And then... This one is just about the intonation and um, the flow. So, Skeet and Nig were too good-natured for quarrelling. Besides, they belonged to John Thornton. So, they were too good-natured to quarrel, and besides which, he knew they were his dogs, and so he wouldn't fight them, he wouldn't try to kill them. But any other dog he'd learnt, it was kill or be killed, okay? Okay. Skate and Nick were too good natured for quarreling. For quarreling. For quarreling. Besides, they belonged to John Norton. Thornton, sorry. John Thornton, yes. <laughs> well done. But Lynn, does it mean, yep. does it mean like besides 
because they belong to him and he is very kind and so on and because of it the uh, bug uh, suppose uh, that uh, they um, have no abilities for quarreling because they belong to him and he, he is very kind gentleman so because um, of it yeah it's kind of yeah it's like that um, because they belong to John Thornton and he loved John Thornton he wouldn't attack his dogs okay does that make sense Yes, but I, I thought it a little bit different because, uh, in, yes, I know what you are thinking, but i thinking about a little bit maybe different that uh, because they, belongs, uh, they belong to John Thornton, these two dogs. They are actually because John Thornton ha will, uh, would have only like uh, good-natured dogs, not because he uh, the buck, uh, they doesn't are want also, to hurt. Yeah. But it's it's it does say that it says he they were too good na they were good natured so he didn't attack them, but he would have attacked them anyway. He'd been brutalized. Remember, a lot of animals and people who've been brutalized will react badly to any other person. Um, but it's saying he also accepted that they were um, his dogs, and because even if they hadn't, maybe they hadn't been. Um, his dogs, even though they were good-natured, he might have attacked them anyway, okay? He might just have done so anyway. So, any questions? And quite often we'll say nowadays, we'd say something like, besides which, okay? Besides that. But um, it's just saying it without that, okay? Besides. just You can add the which or that if you want to. <laughs> besides which. <laughs> okay? No questions? So, Moz, are you okay to read? Mm, I'm ready, Reem. Excellent. Good, good, good. Okay, so hopefully Reem... It looks like... It's strange, because I thought Reem was a member of LEM, but I only have sent her uh, um, an invitation, so hopefully she'll be able to join us. But anyway, um, whenever you're ready to start, Moz. Okay, okay. He was older than the days he had seen, and the breaths... He had drawn, he linked the past with the present, and the eternity behind throbbed through him in a mighty rhythm to which he swayed as the tides and, and seasons swayed. He sat by John Thompson's fire, a broad breasted dog, white fanged and long furred. But behind him were the shades of all manner of dogs, half wolves and wild wolves, Sorry. urgent and prompting, Sorry. tasting the savior of the meat. Sorry. He ate, thirsting for the water he drank, sending the wind with him, listening with him, and telling, he, telling him the sounds made by the water wildlife in the forest, dictating his moods, directing his actions, lying down to sleep with him. When he lay down, and dreaming with him, and beyond him, and becoming themselves the stuff of his dreams. So preemptorily did the, these shades beckon him, that each day mankind and claims, and the claims of mankind sleep Farther from him, deep in the forest, a call was sounding, and as often as he heard this, this, this call, mysteriously thr thrilling and lurking, he felt compelled to turn his back upon the fire, 
and beaten earth around it, and to plunge into the forest and on and on. He knew not where or why, nor did the did he wonder where or why the the call sounding imperiously deep in the forest, but as often he gained the soft unbroken earth and the green shade. The love for John Thornton drew him back to the fire again. Thor Thornton ho alone held him. The rest of man was was as nothing. Chance travelers might praise, might praise or pet him, but he was called under it all. And from a true demonstrative man who would get up and walk away. When, jo when Tom Tom's partners, Hans and Pete, arrived on the long-expected raft, Buck refused to notice them till he learned they were close to Thorn Thorn. <laughs> After that, he tolerated them in a passive sort of way accepting favors from them as though he favored them by accepting they were of the same large type of thumpton living close to earth thinking simply and seeing clearly and ere they swung the raft into the big eddy by the sawmill at Dawson, they understood Buck and his way, and his ways, and did not insist upon an intimacy such as obtained with the skid and nig. For Thornton, however, his love, his love seemed to grow and grow. He alone among men could put a pack upon Buck's back. In the summer traveling, nothing was too great for Buck to do when Thompson commanded. One day, they had grabbed staked themselves from the proceeds of the raft and, the, and left Dawson for the head, headwaters of the Tara, Tanana. The men and dogs were sitting on the crest of a cliff which fell away fell away straight down to na naked bedrock 300 feet, 300 feet below. John Thompson was sitting the edge back at his shoulder as, thought as of a thoughtless whim seized Thompson and he drew the attention of Hans and Pete to the experiment he had in mind. Jump back, he commanded sweeping his arm, arm out, over the chasm. The next instant, he was grappling with Buck on the extreme, on the extreme edge, while Hans and Pete were dragging them back. It's uncanny, Pete said, after it was over and they had coughed their speech. Tom Tom shock, shook his head. No, it is splendid and it is terrible too. Do you know it? Sometimes makes me afraid. I'm not hankering to be the man the, that lays hands on you while he's around. Pete announced conclusively, nodding his head toward Buck. Pai Jingo was Hans' contribution. Not myself, me either. Okay, it well was done. Okay, so that, <laughs> very good. Well done. Okay, so um, a few words for you. Word endings today seem to be the um, the letter of the day. Word endings. So let's have a look. The first one is sat. You've got to get that t at the end to sit, and then the past tense is sat. Uh uh, sat. That's it. Now this next one is funny. Uh, it's peremptorily. Oh, so we say per, per, 
peremptorily. So it's got peremptorily or peremptory is normally what it is. Peremptory. So peremptorily. Try it. <laughs> it's a horrible one. Uh, peremptorily. Yeah. Do you know what it means? Peremptorily. Uh, so you do something first. Never heard of this. It means you have to do something now. <laughs> Okay. If you say something, it's um, if you say something like "sit down," it's a peremptory command. It means "sit down now." Okay, you're not waiting for somebody to argue. Um, you're expecting instant obedience. Okay, so if you're doing it in a peremptory way, a peremptory, he did it peremptorily. Ah. <laughs> okay. You will see it. You probably won't need ever to say it because I don't think you're that kind of person. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yes, the next please. one, which is very important, where or why? Okay. Not where. Not where or why. Where or why? Uh, where or why? Yes. Be careful. You said it several times like were and were is the past tense of to be. We were in the sim we were we were in um we were talking about classical music earlier were okay but where were we doing that uh, in webinar jam okay so where not were okay work on that one and then uh, where, air uh, air he said now it's very old-fashioned and it's very uh <laughs> it's literary english you will still see it air we went so it's air like air that we breathe okay so it's not ear it's, yeah. it's not a short form of here, it's just air, okay? Air. Yeah. yeah, if you do any Shakespeare, you'll see it a lot. <laughs> okay, the next one is intimacy. Intimacy. To be intimate, intimacy. Try it. Intimacy. Yeah, good. And the next one, it's a hard C. It's chasm. A chasm opened up. <laughs> Uh, chasm. Yeah, that's one you have to just learn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We we say chalk, but chasm. These these sometimes these words you just have to learn which way, whether it's a hard C or a soft ch sound. Okay. And also um, one that you've said before, slightly wrong. To catch, he caught. Caught. Mm. Caught. Yes. It's almost like, um, well, it is. It's it's a homophone of court. Yeah. The court of St. Louis, uh, the court of King Louis, and he caught a cold. Okay. The same sound. Don't get confused by the spelling. Okay. Okay. Then, I mean, uh, may I repeat about were and were? Because I'm um, yeah. usually confused to pronounce this. Okay. Let this me give you words. a sentence, okay? Um, okay. Try that sentence, okay? Okay. Uh, he didn't know where they were. That's it. He didn't know where they were. So write that down and practice it. It's, it's just a way of um, training your brain. It's like brain training. You have to drill sometimes, especially if you're having a particular problem with a particular sound of a common word. I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about air or uh, peremptorily. I need to practice that one. Uh, <laughs> but with where and were, yes, definitely you need to train them. Okay. <laughs> Okay. okay <laughs> yeah, welcome. Then, just to finish off, um, you said living close to Earth. Now that would make it Earth, as in the planet. And they're not talking about the planet there. They're living close to the Earth. It means they're living off the land. Okay. Farmers live close to the Earth. Okay. Rather than Earth, the planet. Okay. I mean, we all live close to Earth. We've got no choice at the moment. <laughs> but if you live close to the Earth. The earth means you're living off the land. Okay. We're, oh, we're, on, we're on earth. Okay. We're on earth. Uh, April is almost sitting on the earth, but she's actually sitting on a blanket. <laughs> and there's snow between us and the earth here. <laughs> but yeah, if you're living close to the earth, living close to the land, it means you're 
you're, you're basically self-sufficient, if you like, okay? And then the last one, and I'm only going to tell you this one. It's somebody's name, but you were struggling a little bit with it, and it's a very important word in English. So it's Thornton. Thornton, not Thornton, just Thornton. Try it. Uh, Thornton. Yeah. Do you know why it's important? Uh... <laughs> And I don't know, but okay. uh, Americans. No, nothing to do with Americans. Americans. No, it's it's basically to do with British people, and it's because of Thorntons. <coughs> Thorntons toffee and Thorntons chocolate. <laughs> very very no? important. <laughs> <coughs> So you need to know how to pronounce them. Thornton, okay? One of my favourite chocolates. Is, is, it, is it in Liverpool? Um, I don't actually know where they're based. I mean, they are a British um, company. Because <coughs> they call the Everton fans toffees, maybe. And the Everton is from Liverpool, so... I'm just guessing, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I mean, they, they're pretty much everywhere in the UK where their head office is... Um, I don't know. It just says registered office Greenford. I don't know where Greenford is. <laughs> Where's Greenford? I've never heard of Greenford. But you'll see that if you go to any um, airport in the UK, you'll find a Thornton's. They're, they're a big franchise. And after operation. eight, is there. After eight, chocolate, uh, chocolate is. I don't uh, think after eight is Thornton's. No, I think that's Round Trees or somebody okay. else. Um, Greenford is oh, it's London, a large sub suburb in the London borough of Ealing. There you go. What, I didn't even know that. Okay, so um, next week we will read from. Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Uh, Circle City. Oh, this is also my 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 question, uh, uh, which was the last passage. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Let me have a look. Yeah, yeah. I would like to take notes as well, and I have lost the text. <laughs> um. Hmm. I'm not sure where you wrote it, Eleanor. No, it's simply I, I would like uh, to, to uh, take notes of the last sentences most read. Oh, the the corrections you mean? And uh, no, no, just the, uh, the 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 point in the text. Oh, I see. Good. Uh, okay, yes. Let here here it is. I've got you now. Sorry, I was <laughs> being particularly oh, yeah. dense today. Okay, this. No, from it's here. my fault. Probably <laughs> no, my no, English. I oh, thank you. <laughs> I think, no, you, you explained it perfectly. I was just misinterpreting. I thought you meant what Moz had read, not where we're up to. What you could have said is, I need to know where we're up to. So it's from, it was at up Circle to, City. Okay. Yeah. And look, there's air again. Air, the year was out. But honestly, guys, you do not say that in normal conversation, but you will read it in um, literature, okay? <laughs> Before the year was out or at the point that the year was out, Okay. Okay, so Paul Reem couldn't join us. Um, I'll go and uh, send her a message. Um, not sure what's going on there, but it happens sometimes. Any questions before I disappear? I think next week we'll probably, if we make the same progress as today, we will finish the book next week, okay? If not next week, the week after, because there's only one, one and a bit chapters to go. So I'm then. You were very optimistic. <laughs> Am I? Oh, well, you never know. I mean, some, sometimes I think. <laughs> well, okay, Marco, I'll, let, me, let me explain. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, there's only two chapters now. Remember, there's a lot of guff at the end of um, books in. Uh, I don't know. I, th I think it's doable, isn't it? We did one chapter before, remember? We did a whole chapter 
uh, a couple of weeks back. So it's only one and a half chapters. And if we get that close to the end, then, you know, I might just say to you, have you all got time to carry on? You never know. <laughs> Shiny, why are you writing I'm dense? Question mark. Is that a question to me? Are you dense? No, you're not dense. <laughs> Oh, me, dense. I'm a, yeah, me. I'm a little dense today. It means being stupid. <laughs> Not generally dense all the time, but today I'm being particularly stupid. <laughs> Thick, if you like. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit dense today. As in, I couldn't kind of work out what Eleanor was asking. I'm slightly distracted as well. If you watch the, if you watch the, um, replay you'll see on my computer because april says you can see what i'm doing on my computer and you'll see that i was trying desperately to get reem back in while still listening to you guys and that's distracted me somewhat but and it didn't work which is really annoying <laughs> okay yeah thick as two short planks by the way they've got to be short planks don't ask me why but they have to be thick as two short planks <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for coming along and reading. It was good fun. And I will see you hopefully in the next session. Uh, take care. And uh, yeah, as I say, any questions, just ask on the phone. Oh, let me give you the corrections, the link to the corrections. Here you go. <clears throat> so if you want to, and if you want to check my corrections, you can now just have a look at the, th uh, at the stream, <laughs> at the recording. Bye then. Bye. Take care. And, and through the soft sighing breezes, like wayfarers to death, staggered the two men, the woman, woman and the huskies. With the dogs falling, Mercedes weeping and riding, Hal swearing innocuously, and Charles's eyes wistfully watering, they staggered into John Taunton's camp at the mouth of White River. When they halted, the dogs dropped down as though they had all been struck dead. Mercedes dried her eyes and looked at, at John Thornton. Charles sat down on a log to rest. He sat down very slowly and painstakingly, but of his great stiffness. Hal did the talking. John Thornton was whittling the last touches on an axe handle he had made from a stick of badge. He waited and listened, gave monosyllabic replies, and, when it was asked, Tess advice. He knew the breed, and he gave his advice in the certainty that it would not be followed. They told us up above that the bottom was dropping out of a trail, and that the best thing for us to do was to lay ever, Hal said in response to Thornton's warning to take no more chances on the rotten ice. They told us we couldn't make White River, and here we are, this last with a sneering ring of triumph in it. And they told you true, that fell and could not rise. Hal had traded off his revolver, and he took the axe and knocked Billy on the head as he lay in the traces, then cut the carcass out of the harness and dragged it to one side. Buck saw and his mates saw, and they knew that this thing was very close to them. On the next day, Kuna went, and but five of them remained. Joe, too far gone to be, to be malignant, Pike, crippled and limping, only half conscious and not conscious enough longer for Malinger. Solex, the one-eyed, 
still faithful to the toil of trace and trail, and mournful in that he had so little strength with which to pull. Dick, who had not travelled so far that winter, and who was now beaten more than the others because he was fresher, and Buck, still at the head of the team, but no longer uh, enforcing discipline or striving to enforce it, blind with the weakness half the time, and keeping the tray by the loom of it, and by the dim feel of his feet. It was beautiful spring weather, but neither dogs nor humans were aware of it. Each day the sun rose earlier and set later. It was dawn by three in the morning, and twilight lingered till nine at night. The hell long day was a blaze of sunshine. The ghostly winter silence had given way to the great spring murmur of awakening life. This murmur arose from all the land, fraught with the joy of living. It came from the things that lived and moved again, things which had been as dead and which had not moved during the long months of frost. The sap was rising in the pines, the willows and aspens were bursting out in young buds, shrubs and vines were putting on fresh garbs of green, crickets sang in the nights, and in the days all manner of creeping, crawling things rustled, rustled forth into the sun. Partridges and woodpeckers were booming and knocking in the forest. Squirrels were chattering, birds singing, and ever heard honked the white fowl driving up from the south in cunning wedges that split the air. From every hill slope came the trick of running water, the music of unseen fountains, or things were thawing, bending, snapping. The Yukon was straining to break loose the ice that bound it down. It ate away from beneath. The sun ate from above. Her hairs formed, fissures sprang and spread apart, while, th while thin sections of ice fell through bodily into the river. And amid all this bursting, rending, throbbing of awakening life under the blazing sun. We go. Okay, so we're coming towards the end of our book, um, The Call of the Wild. We left Buck in dire straits last week, I'm afraid, and his um, fellow dogs are all suffering terribly on the trail. Um, Eleanor, whenever you're ready, if you would like to uh, start reading. Yes, I. I I, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> As it was with Buck, uh, uh, I apologize. It's not me, it's my uncle. <laughs> it's quite noisy today. As it was with Buck, so was it with his mates. They were perambulating skeletons. There were seven all together, including him. In their very great misery, they had become insensible to the bite of the lash or the bruise of the club. The pain of the beating was dull and distant, just as the things the eyes saw and the uh, yes had, seemed, had seemed dull and distant. They were not half living or quarter living. There were simply so many bags of bones in which sparks of life fluttered faintly. When a hold was made, they dropped down in the traces like dead dogs, and the spark dimmed and paid and seemed to go out. And when the club or whip fell upon them, the spark fluttered feebly up, and they tottered to their feet and staggered on. There came a day when Billy, the good-natured John Thornton, Thornton answered, the bottoms likely to drop out in at any moment. Only fools with the blind lack of fools could have made it, 
I tell you straight, I wouldn't risk my carcass on that ice for all the gold in Alaska. Very good, well done. Okay. Some so, noise could hear it. Uh, um, sorry, Eleanor. No, no, it was fine. Um, you've got a noisy uh, uncle with did. you, have you? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I have no idea what they, they are do, doing, doing. <laughs> renovating. Okay. <laughs> Well, hopefully they'll. Um, but it didn't affect your voice at all. I didn't. I don't know if anybody else heard. Oh, anything, good, but good. I didn't. Yes, right. it's good. It's all good. Okay, so um, first of all, nicely read. Well done. It's always difficult being the first one. Um, so we'll start with the first word here to perambulate. Perambulating. Uh, perambulating. Very perambulating. Good, yes. Perambulating. A halt. Yes, yes, halt. It's yeah, easy. It's, it's uh -huh. just, okay. Yeah, I... yeah the, the first one, though, it's just um, don't stress that first syllable, per. It's like percent, but perambulating. Okay. Um, it's not like saying price per uh -huh. pound. It's just so you don't stress the first syllable. It's just to perambulate. We were perambulating. Okay. The next one, halt. Yeah, you, you were right. Halt. Halt. Yeah, 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 yeah. it is. And, yeah. <laughs> and then malinga with the hard g sound. Malinga, okay. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh, like we say the I same was... with linger. Finger, linger.